What's up everyone, Tom from the Airsoft Headquarters and welcome back. Today, I'm gonna to be going over the Kidby Way Ronin T10. We did get some available and I like this one so much that I decided to pick this one up for myself. So we're gonna be able to go a little bit more in depth with one of these rifles if you guys want to see that. Uh, but before we get into the actual review and overview of the T10, let you guys know that we have the uh, pre-order of the special edition Ronin T10, which is going to be the T10 with a Cerakote gray uh, rail system, upper uh, receiver, as well as a stock. And we don't have any clear information yet, but I am assuming that they're going to have a Gate Titan pre-installed in all of these special edition rifles. So just so you guys are aware, we do have those available for pre-order on our website, www.theairsoftheadquarters.com if you wanted to pick those up before they are all gone. Now, now that I got that out of the way, let's get into the actual review of video. So the Kibiwe Ronin T10 comes in their new Ronin style of cardboard box. Uh, Kibiwe is well known for having a little bit more basic style of box. Um, I like them. And then we have the rifle itself. Obviously, uh, I've done a couple of additions to mine here specifically. Um, made mine a little bit more of a streamlined, low profile type of setup with some extra accessories. I think it looks nice. You guys can tell me what you think down in the comments below. If you guys have watched any of our previous videos, you know that I did a review video of the Ronin T10. If you have not seen that video, that is up in this section right here. I'm gonna put a little news thing right there. But overall, those two are gonna be very, very similar. The T10 is coming from the Ronin series as well. So it has a M-Lock rail system, just like on this guy here, uh, with the uh, overall very same similar in features as the Ronin T10. The 10 obviously is referring to the 10 inch barrel length versus the T6 is a six inch barrel option. Uh, the T10 itself is going to be a recoil based system from the RM4 versus the T6, T6 is from their VM4, variable velocity M4 series. Um, but I've already done a video about the T6. This one is gonna be about the T10. Right away out of the box, there is going to be a very bright, or not bright, but a anodized orange flash hider that is legally required here in the US for uh, the purchase of a airsoft rifle. Of course, once you have it in your, uh, in your name, you can do whatever you want to it. I personally put a Ace Tech Lighter R on there so I can use greens and reds uh, freely. Going back is going to be KWA TML-11 rail system in M-Lock. The very top of the rail system is going to be a Picatinny with fairly large cutouts along the top of there to make it fairly lightweight. Along the three, six, and nine o'clock positions are going to be M-Lock slots for all of your M-Lock rail accessories. Like I have here, I have the PTS Fortis hand stop. Uh, with that curvature up there with the Picatinny that allows for my hand to fit there pretty nicely to do a C-clamp as I'm aiming down sights. And then on the uh, noon uh, nine o'clock position, I have a M-Lock 45 degree flashlight mount for one of the AIM Sports OD green that can do straight light and strobe, which I like that. I always like strobe. This is gonna be more of a indoor base gun. Um, and on the 45 degrees on the upper and lower parts of the rail system are gonna be fairly large cutouts to make it all very, very lightweight. Uh, KWA is gonna have a metal barrel system. And then there is going to be imitation gas block that runs the entire length of that barrel system on the inside underneath the rail. So it looks fairly realistic. I think that's a cool aspect when airsoft manufacturers are putting a imitation gas block doesn't actually do anything, but it has a very cool look to it, making it look a little bit more realistic. Again, that's just my personal taste, but that's, again, that's my personal taste, but you guys can choose whatever you want. The KWA T10 is going to have KWA's standard uh, full metal reinforced aluminum receiver for the upper and the lower section. Of course, with that upper rail system, that Picatinny is going to continue the entire length, which out of the box is going to hold the PTS Imbis uh, iron sights. 
Now I've covered the Embus befores. These are gonna be just a standard flip up. They're not a fancy button release or anything like that. During the upward position, the front post does have a elevation switch that you can control elevation via the front post. The rear has control of left and right for windage. It also has a flipping daytime and nighttime aperture, depending if you are using these iron sights in low light or bright light environments. Uh, if you flip them down, then you can use just any sort of low mount of red dot. Uh, I personally have one of the Aim Sports low mount uh, 30 millimeter aperture, I believe. Um, and then I have one of the uh, skeletonized riser systems that we have here that is a quick detach on this side here. Uh, we have these available that go directly into the AIM Sports. Um, I like them. I think this is a very, very cool and streamlined look. So I'm a huge fan of it. That's why I ended up picking that guy up. If we continue to the back of the upper receiver, you have a ambidextrous charging handle that you can pull back and inside the window is going to reveal a rotary style of hop-up that is coming standard with KDV weight rifles. Uh, rotary hop-up is definitely the more advantageous type of hop-up to use, allowing you a little bit more control and a little bit more, I guess, fine tuning for the backspin of the BB as it goes through the inner barrel. So you can be as accurate and as uh, precise as possible. Uh, with most RM4s, if you pull back on the charging handle and also push this tab inwards, that imitation bolt release is supposed to hold open for mine for some reason does not. I don't know if that's something that I did on my end when I changed the internal spring out, um, but I'm definitely going to crack this open and try to see if I can fix that. If we continue downwards, it's going to be just a right-hand standard operation magazine release. Nothing on the left-hand side of the rifle for a ambidextrous magazine release. So magazine is in, you only have that right hand magazine release. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, um, especially if you have different styles of magazines that fit in there really nicely without any sort of issue. If I was shooting left-handed using a right hand style mag release, I can still get that magazine out and change it. On the left hand side of the rifle, we do have that imitation bolt release like I was explaining earlier that uh, is supposed to work in conjunction with that imitation bolt release with holding it open. Like I said, mine doesn't work for whatever reason, but I'm gonna try my best to fix it. Um, I've not seen that being a issue with other KWA rifles. I think it's something that I possibly messed up when I was taking it apart in order to change that internal spring. So I'm gonna say that's my bad. With KWA rifles, there are going to be a ambidextrous selector switch. For some reason, they made that ambidextrous, but not everything else. So on the right hand side of the rifle is going to be the right hand selector switch, which is nice and long switch for anyone that's right handed. You have full control of movement for going from safe, semi and full auto. Uh, these have a very crisp ball bearing inside of them. So you know when you are on selector and it actually holds its position very well. Uh, you shouldn't have any issue with knocking those out of place. However, on the left hand side of the receiver, the uh, left-handed selector switch is much shorter than that of the right hand. So if I was trying to get the uh, left-hand selector switch into safe, I need to actually rotate my hand off of the grip here in order to get it off to safe. And if anyone does have a little bit longer of thumbs, I'm trying to get from uh, safe to semi, the longer switch here on this side actually does not work well since it's knocking into my finger. Uh, so that is one issue if you are left hand specific. Um, maybe look at getting some aftermarket uh, selector switches, or you should also be able to just swap the left and the right hand selector switch. I don't see why that would be any sort of issue. So what is unique with this KBUA T10, I don't know why I didn't notice it earlier, but the front face of that trigger has a rounded face to it compared to everything else that is a uh, coming from different brands that are available on the market have a more flat face of trigger. Um, I don't know why that stood out to me on the T10 specifically. Uh, with other Kidbyway rifles, they do have a rounded face, but for some reason in playing with the T10, uh, that was something that came to my attention, is that very smooth T uh, rounded trigger face, which I'm a huge fan. I actually like that feature. 
it seems much softer compared to the uh, flat face, which can get a little annoying, uh, especially if you're trying to spam the trigger in any sort of CQB environment. Uh, for me, at least it does. So I like the fact that they went with the rounded face. If we go farther down, we have the PTS uh, enhanced polymer grip. No, not the enhanced polymer grip, the uh, compact polymer grip, I think is what that is, the CPG. Uh, what's different about this is that the actual angle of it is slightly forward and there is no beaver tail. I prefer to have that beaver tail hook and to have the angle more uh, inclined compared to this one, which is more vertical. But for some reason, this actually feels very good to me, uh, especially since I'm going to probably be using this mostly indoors or for any sort of close uh, combat in uh, environments. Um, so having something that's going to allow me to have a more vertical and streamlined position by tucking my elbows in is going to be more beneficial uh, for my play style, at least. And then if we go backwards from there to the back of the receiver is going to be just a standard sling plate that we have here that you would just hook onto the left and the right hand side. Um, this is one of the only places that you can attach your sling other than the uh, PTS enhanced polymer stock, the EPS, which has a quick detach and a very deep lanyard loop. So those three spots specifically are the only spots on this rifle that you can attach a sling to. I know that's something that is very important to a couple of players as far as sling mounting options. Um, so while this is limited, um, it does work better for my style of sling mounting. So I personally appreciate that. With the enhanced polymer stock, what is unique is that the tubes on the left and right hand side of the stock itself are significantly larger than that of the standard SOT mod style of stock, which is this guy. So with the SAT mod stock here that uh, comes stock on some of the other RM4s, these are going to be the same type of dimension that would be used for a nickel metal hydride. Versus the enhanced polymer stock, the tubes themselves are large enough to fit a lithium ion, which have larger cells than nickel metal hydride. Put this back real quick. So because the uh, tubes themselves are larger, if we pop this open, you can see that I actually am running a Valken lithium ion that I have right here. Now, like I said before, I was changing out the spring to a indoor legal limit at 350 feet per second. So for myself, I would prefer to run a 7.4 volt so I don't have any sort of issue with uh, arcing the contacts with using a 11.1, uh, especially since uh, internally, this is going to have a standard trigger contacts, no fancy MOSFET system. Uh, however, what is unique with this type of gearbox, with the T10 specifically, is according to the description, it has been modified to be able to fit any sort of aftermarket gate Titan uh, system. Now, if you guys are not familiar with the gate Titan, um, that is the number one recommended kind of end-all be-all uh, trigger MOSFET system that is available on the airsoft market. And now the reason that uh, I'm being very specific about the gearbox is that previously on the market with KWA uh, RM4 or the recoil based systems is that internally they were completely proprietary, meaning there wasn't anything available aftermarket that would fit within the KBWA gearbox that would work with their very reinforced internals, which was kind of a downside to a lot of their KWA rifles. However, like I said before, the T10 specifically was described as having a gearbox that would fit the Gate Titan. And the Gate Titan is supposed to fit with every standard version two gearbox. So, this would be the only KBWA rifle that I would be able to take apart if you guys want to see me open it up and do any sort of exploration, show you guys what it is. I don't have a Titan, but I have the Gate Aster, which is the newest edition, which is I think was the fourth generation of MOSFET from Gate. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's correct off the top of my head. But I have an Aster rear wired that I'd be willing to put into here 
if you guys wanted to see that process as well as see the fitment of everything internally. So with their RM4 system as well, since I have the gearbox, inside of the buffer tube, since I keep saying it's a recoil based system, is a very large piece of copper or brass, I'm assuming this is brass, that sits with inside the buffer tube. And if I grab my rifle without spilling the springs, this would sit right about here or here. So this, as you fire it, would recoil backwards and the rearward spring would force that block forward, giving you a recoil system that would be about the same amount of force as a gas blowback rifle. The back of the KWA RM4 gearbox was originally cut out to allow this bolt to work in conjunction with the standard cylinder and standard cylinder head, piston, and gear ratio system. However, this is still technically a quick change spring system. So if you wanted to via the back of the buffer tube that I'll show you here in a minute, you can pull this entire system out, pulling out your internal AEG spring, swap the AEG spring for a higher or lower tension, and then be able to, if I can do everything in one fluid motion, can then reinstall that with the correct spring or the spring that you want. So that's a pretty neat feature while having a kinetic recoil based system. So if you guys want to see me install the Aster, leave a comment down below. Make sure that, you know, this is something that I should put time and effort into, especially since I'm doing a lot of these videos, you know, before work or after work. So I'm not taking away from dealing with customers. So to make sure it's worth my time, make sure you guys comment, like, and subscribe. Please do those for me. I think we've gone over everything that is here for the T10 specifically. In order to get to that recoil block, readjust myself so I have the rifle here down between my legs. If you take the EPS, pull it out from the middle here and pull upwards, that'll get the stock off of the buffer tube. And I feel like my wires got caught a little bit. So being careful not to yank those out. So here we have the KWA wiring system, which is going to be a Tamiya based connector. And this is going to be a more modern based of fuse system. Instead of the tube fuse, this is more of the uh, car based fuse, which these are more readily available. So you have more access to these. The wiring system goes via this six position locking system that is used for the stock to get the six different positions from all the way forward to all the way back. So the wiring system is very streamlined and that is something you do have to be very careful of if you decide to take this apart. Now, quick disclaimer, with this assembly, it was very difficult even for me to take apart. Uh, it did require a vice lock or a, a, a locking block as well as a very well-built needle nose pliers that I was able to stick into one of the four holes onto the bottom here so I could break it free. I, it did require a lot of force. So you have to be extremely careful with the uh, tools that you have available so as not to make sure to break your tools or to break the, uh, the uh, little end cap here specifically. On the end cap, there is a Phillips head screw drive or Phillips head screw which you are not required to take off or take apart in order to get access to here. As you can see, I'm just undoing it by hand. So this is actually very easy. And that end cap looks like so. Um, the uh, flathead portion of my end cap is pretty scratched up from trying to use a flathead, which I was not able to get the correct results of getting it off. So I had to use a needle nose plier that was industrial based. So very well built. So inside the RM4, this is that recoil base spring that sits behind the uh, piece of brass. And this is the, uh, the uh, unit that will rock backwards and give you that uh, mass or the uh, recoil system going back into your shoulder. And then flipping it upside down, you can pull out your AEG spring. So this one is not the stock one. The stock one is inside the box. This is one that I installed so I could use this indoors safely. So this is shooting at 350 feet per second. Actually, 
we'll be able to go look at the velocity results. I don't have to tell you exactly what it's shooting at. You guys will find that out in just a minute. So reinstalling is literally reverse of operation. So you take your AEG spring, drop it in. Your uh, recoil block and slide it in. Don't drop it in. Being careful not to break anything. The uh, recoil spring that goes onto the back of the block and then the end cap for the buffer tube. One thing that you should take note of is with one of your thumbs putting downward pressure onto the block so as not to make sure that it doesn't spring upwards, possibly into your face or any sort of light fixtures that are directly above you so you don't break anything. Have this pointed in a safe direction. And then once you rotate it enough, you are able to get those threads in alignment so you can, with your free hand, twist that cap back on. Being careful not to uh, wreck your wiring system, which is sitting right here. And it takes usually just a couple seconds to torque that on. Then you have your end cap installed. You can take your enhanced polymer stock from PTS and install that. I like to pull my wiring back through just to make sure it's not gonna get caught anything. Pulling upwards as far as hard as possible on this guy right here so that the entire stock can slide on. And then with that, I can take my lithium ion, install that into the wiring system, not plugging it in because I'm not using it at this time. And then reinstalling the end cap to my stock. And then everything is working and functioning. Inside of the box with the KWA rifle is going to be your manual, or at least uh, the KWA warranty card and a little green uh, card that says the manual is a downloadable type. A KWA sticker, which is going onto my laptop. Boom. And then inside the box as well, are two M-Lock rail mounts. So you can put anywhere on the three, six, nine o'clock position in order to put different flashlights, four grips, grenade launchers, accessories, anything that you would want to put on there. You've got two of the M-Lock Picatinny rail adapters coming in the box with you. That's pretty cool. And then close up and that's going right into the box with the original spring, as well as my uh, safety orange. For me personally, up here in Wisconsin, um, I always like to make sure that I am carrying the rifle in a safe bag or even in the original box if I'm traveling anywhere, as well as taking the tracer unit off and reinstalling the original orange tip just to make sure that if I am pulled over and I do have a discussion with law enforcement that I have an airsoft gun inside of the vehicle, if he wants to inspect it, there is the bright safety orange to let him know before he actually inspects it that it is an airsoft replica only. So me personally, I like to have that. That's just a fail safe. As well, in the box, you are going to get the MS120 magazine, which is a mid-cap style of magazine. Now, this is what we have brought in here to the Airsoft headquarters as a temporary replacement for the PTS EPMs. These are super solid magazines. Like I said, they're mid-cap style. They do have a follower system, so they do feed every round from the magazine into the rifle. So when you are completely empty, you are empty and you're not dropping BBs out of your hop-up when you release, release that magazine. Uh, very thick construction. It does have imitation bullet uh, inserts on the left and right hand side of the magazine. Some pretty cool checkering on the front and back of the magazine for a really solid grip. So when I am doing my left or right hand magazine releases, I know that I am grabbing the magazine and it's not going to slip out. Uh, on the bottom of the magazine specifically are going to be four different segments that are going to be individually dotted. And that is for a little bit more customization for uh, the different numbering system or individual markering system that you wanna do for your magazine. So I would probably do a TM-1, since this is the very first magazine that I have of the MS-120 style. The end cap does come off. So I'm assuming that this will work in conjunction with some of the Ranger pull plates that we have here at the Airsoft headquarters or uh, if you have different colored ones, um, they can probably work on here as well if you want to get that weird two-tone color uh, going. Um, but I'm gonna run it stock because I think it looks cool as heck 
on the T10. All right, so we went over everything with the uh, Ronin T10 externally and give you a little bit of bullet points as far as internal specs. Uh, so let's go over to the chrono range so we can actually see what those velocities are shooting at. All right, so this is the Ronin T10 with 0.20s with the lower velocity spring installed. So I have total 15 shots, the max of 357, a minimum velocity of 346, an average of 353. And that was the lower velocity AEG spring. So let me swap the springs to the stock one and we'll show you just how fast that was shooting. All right, we're back with the stock spring installed, shooting two O's with a 7.4. We have a max of 412 feet per second, a minimum of 404 feet per second, and an average of 408 feet per second. That's pretty hot. That's right over the US standard for uh, basic infantry based rifles. Um, really, at this velocity, even with it being just 10 FPS over, this would classify as a DMR. But now we're going to have a look as far as the recoil of the rifle itself. All right, so with that stock spring inside of there. And then here is the rifle with the 350 FPS spring. We'll see what this is doing as far as recoil. So holding it fairly limp. To me, this feels about the same recoil on full auto. Just letting it shoot. And then I'm gonna actually control it. And there I'm out. Overall, I think that was a pretty good test. Um, I hope that this is usable and you guys can see some of the recoil. If not, then oh well. All right, so I have the QA Ronin T10. We're going to be doing our three-stage accuracy test, 25, 50, and 100 feet. So here we go at 25 feet. So 10 shots, and obviously with a red dot, I am going to retain a little bit of consistency, but... uh. We'll, we'll take that into consideration as we bump this out to 50 and then 100 feet. So let's go do that. Yep, here we go at 50 feet. All right, that was 10 shots at 50 feet. Let's go bump it out to 100 feet, what do you say? All right, that was 10 total shots. Now we're gonna look at the results. All right, guys, we're back in the studio for the uh, overview of the shooting results. So I kept the original 350 FPS spring inside of here. I was just a little too lazy to throw it back into the original 400 spring. And so we were shooting 0.25s, the Elite Force Bios, outside at 25, 50, and 100 feet. And here are the results. Let's talk through them together. So at, at 25 feet, we've got a Dorito chip type of shape of grouping. Um, overall, that is a two and a half inch spread at the uh, widest points of BB impacts. Again, that's 25 feet using the uh, optic that I had on here. Didn't want to take it off and change it. So I just left it on there. So we know there is going to be a little bit of in, uh, discrepancy. Uh, from using iron sights. If you are using iron sights, the results were with a red dot. So we're all aware. And so at 25 feet, two and a half spread, 10 out of 10 hits, not that hard. 
At 50 feet, we had a spread of five inches. So doubling the spread, and then we had 10 out of 10 impacts as well. Aiming for center mass, they were all rising just a little bit. Um, that was from the hop up. I'm assuming with that silicone oil that was rubbing out of the hop up unit, which is pretty normal for KBA rifles. They usually spray a lot of silicone oil inside of there. And so just having to shoot through the oil or cleaning it out is gonna be the best way to you know, get your hop up bucking back into spec. And then over at 100 feet, we had nine out of 10 shots hit the target. Again, aiming for the body. And it was just at 100 feet, just lobbing them in there. They did have a little bit of a right hand curve because of a storm that was building. So uh, we did have a left to right wind variance, which resulted in the right hand curve of the BB. So nine out of 10 impacts with the BB impacts that are currently on here, a nine and three quarter inch spread at 100 feet, which pretty good, 100 feet, you're gonna miss a little bit. Obviously, if you go with higher velocity using heavier weight BBs, you are gonna remain a little bit more consistent. And if you go with any lighter of a BB, you're gonna have more inconsistencies. Uh, just so we're all aware. These are the results of the uh, variables that I used, which was a Elite Force 0.25 biodegradable weight, shooting at 350 feet per second. And then there is or was a storm that was happening outside. So at 100 feet, did not get all of those impacts. Overall, good results. I mean, they could be better. I could have a little tighter grouping at 50 feet. I could have gotten all 10 shots at 100 feet, but this is the reality. As long as all of the BBs were not missing and at 25 feet, that's a pretty decent sized grouping. Uh, all within a Dorito chip size of group. Throw that off to the side there. So now we get to the point of the video where I kind of just talk about it. With the KWA uh, spec of receiver systems being all metal, they are built a little bit more hefty uh, with more material built up in certain places of the receiver and the rail system resulting in a pretty heavy rifle. Uh, for me personally, looking at this on the wall, I think it's fairly lightweight, or at least I assume it's fairly lightweight. However, picking it up, this does come in at, I think it was eight pounds. So it's got a little bit of heft to it. Um, I would have to double check that though. I think I'll put the correct numbers somewhere around here, but it is fairly heavy. So even though I am using this more as a indoor base gun or a quick acquisition target or quick target acquisition base of rifle, uh, mainly using this for uh, training simulations. I will take this out to some outdoor fields just to run through a couple paces and see what the results are, um, outdoors at least, and maybe take this indoors if I am feeling like it or if I do have any free time. Of course, I always feel like playing airsoft. Um, however, because of that heavy factor, uh, it's probably not going to be a great option to lug around for long periods of times, given exactly how heavy it is. Uh, especially if I'm maybe on a corner or in a doorway waiting for any sort of movement to come through the door, I am gonna get those forearm wobbles up here because of how heavy it is and I'm gonna end up dropping it. Overall, I don't think there are any sort of negatives. Of course, I am planning on going a little bit more in depth with this by getting the gate aster and doing a installation video. Um, overall, I'm hearing mixed results of the asters. I'm hearing some negative things. I'm hearing some positive things. Overall, I think we just gotta go for it. Give the old college try. Uh, so we do have the asters here in the store. I'm just gonna end up grabbing one and dropping it in here since the T10 is designed to be a, or at least is advertised to design to be a uh, gearbox that allows for drop in aftermarket um, MOSFET systems. So we're gonna give it a try. We're gonna see what happens. And then that'll be another video and then that'll be gameplay video as well. So this is going to be a little bit of a project gun, project gun just like with the uh, MCX, how that's gonna end up being another video. Um, but yeah, 
Overall, right now, immediate impressions and immediate results are those of very, very positive ones. Like I said, with the special edition T10 that is coming out that we have on pre-order, I suspect that these are going to be pre-installed with some gate uh, internals and maybe built to be more of high-end rifles, especially with that nice Cerakote finish um, because they are pretty pricey. So we just got to wait until tomorrow. Maybe we'll get some more information uh, from our KWA rep, um, especially since I'm recording this on the weekend. So since I'm doing this on the weekend, maybe down in the description, I'll be able to put some more information about the special edition T10. But for now, overall, a really solid gun. That's other than the weight, that's really the only negative thing that I can think about this rifle for me personally. I mean, it's overall a solid KWA rifle. Out of the box, it's performing very, very good. Uh, with 7.4 at that lower velocity, I'm getting some pretty snappy uh, trigger spawns on semi. Full auto, uh, it's what, 20 rounds a second, 25 rounds a second. So nothing too impressive, but I'm not using it to hose down any sort of targets. I'm not using that full auto feature anywhere for any reason. So semi-automatic, as long as I get a good trigger response, I'm pretty happy. Um, and of course, if you guys wanna see the in-depth internals of the KWA T10, I'll be doing another video on that. But that's probably gonna be another week or two before I'm able to put that out. So if you guys do have any further questions about the KWA T10, put it down in the comment section. As always, like and subscribe. Um, and if you guys wanna see anything else, make sure to go through the rest of the videos that I have out. Um, maybe I have something else from a uh, KWA series or maybe some other type of rifle, type of rifle that you're looking for. Um, I'm about to finish up the G and G review video. Of course, uh, like I was saying before, there's a weird power struggle between the Avalons, KWA and the G2 based rifles. So I'm finishing up those reviews. So that will be another review video as far as which of the three are going to be the better option. We're going to break it down for you guys to figure out. Um, and that's it for what I have for you guys right now. You guys take care, stay safe, stay positive, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.